Thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm Professor Rao. I teach here at George Mason Law School, and it's really an honor for me to moderate such a distinguished panel. I've read through the papers that they've submitted to the Law Review, and they really do present an interesting range of perspectives, not your, not your usual platitudes about judicial activism or engagement, as it were. We will begin with Professor Presser. Thank you. It's uh, an absolute treat to be here, uh, but as somebody on the second panel, I'm suffering the fate that so often uh, befalls us, and that is that everything I'm going to say has already been said by Kurt, Eric, and by Elizabeth uh, in the last panel, but I have pictures. <laughs> so I'm going to say the whole thing uh, again. Um, I'm uh, deeply delighted to be here, George Mason, and uh, in particular to uh, be associated for a little while with the Institute for Justice and the Center uh, for Judicial Engagement. And uh, what this presentation is, is a long-winded way of saying, if you really believe in judicial engagement, this case, the one involving the individual mandate, uh, is one where judges ought to be engaged and ought to throw the thing right out. Um, but lest you be misled, uh, you've heard some wonderful things today already uh, about sophisticated constitutional theory and, and levels of scrutiny and uh, lots and lots of legal history. I'm going to do a little bit of legal history, but I want to put you uh, in the frame that this talk is conceived in. Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful Peanuts strip um, in which Peanuts is uh, dealing with his friend Schroeder, and the two of them are doing papers for their third grade class. And, uh, Charlie Brown says to Schroeder, well, what's your paper on? And Schroeder says, well, my paper is on the metaphysics of Heidegger. And he asks Charlie, Charlie, what's your paper on? And Charlie says, my paper is on our friend the beaver. This is an our friend the beaver talk that I'm going to give you. Uh, lots of pictures, a little bit of uh, theory, but not, not really deep. Um, so let me start with one of the problems that we face as constitutional law teachers uh, when we're trying to think about how the court's going to do something or how the court ought to behave. The truth of the matter is our Supreme Court, almost unique I think uh, in the world, is made up of strong personalities and they all have theories. That's uh, John Marshall Harlan II, uh, much in vogue uh, when I went to law school and a man I think capable of uh, really, really refined thought and tremendous uh, involved explanations of how the court ought to do whatever it is he thinks it ought to do. Um, I think that's typical of constitutional theory. More than that, uh, and you heard this referred to a little bit earlier, there's uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. We don't tend to think of Holmes too much as a constitutional theorist, but in the common law, basically what he said is, judges are legislators. Uh, let's recognize that, uh, and in his talks, uh, he did it as well. I, I, I happen to agree with David Bernstein and the approach that David takes in his book that when Holmes said the Constitution has no economic theory of uh, neither Herbert Spencer's uh, nor the organic state, I think he got it wrong. I think the Constitution does have an economic theory, but it gets pretty obscure. But there are other folks uh, on the court, take that man for example, um, who do have, I think, a much more tradition-based theory, and then uh, there's your old boss uh, who's got an even clearer idea of uh, original understanding that I think ought to be applied uh, in cases like this one, and that leads us, I think, to a somewhat clearer articulation of constitutional theory. If you want the details, it's in, uh, if I say so myself, my much neglected but brilliant 1994 book, um, now alas, out of print. Uh, Put another way, put another way. What we're really trying to do here, and this has been mentioned several times, is think about the Tenth Amendment. I mean, we can talk about libertarian theory, and I'll make a point or two uh, with regard to that, but it's really the text of that amendment that's the most important thing. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. But as we've kind of glancingly hinted before, we're now in a very unusual situation where the political parties are completely divided on this. The Tenth Amendment is a banner flown by the Republicans and one that doesn't seem to have that much meaning uh, 
to the Democrats at all, just as it doesn't have an enormous amount of meaning, I think, uh, to most of the folks in the legal academy at this point. If we polled them two years ago whether Obamacare would be successfully challenged in the Supreme Court, I think 90 to 95 percent of them would have said with Nancy uh, Pelosi, are you serious? But now we know uh, there really is something going on here. Um, we might ask, uh, what would the Founding Fathers do uh, in this instance? What kind of guidance do we have? And that brings us back, uh, really, to what Eric was talking about a little bit earlier, and that's the concept of federalism and what happened to it uh, in the New Deal. Uh, indeed, I'll come back to this once or twice more, Franklin Roosevelt's colossal uh, electoral victories, in particular in 1936, uh, led to a situation in which the federal government was finally allowed to regulate uh, in ways that it never could before. Indeed, what I like to tell my students is the ethos then became and was until 1995, if it moves, regulate it. If it doesn't move, kick it, then regulate it. Um, and yet, and yet, in the last 20 years, uh, not only the Judicial Engagement Project not only the Institute for Justice, but the Federalist Society has begun to think, really, is this right? Is that what we want? Uh, and we come back to these two folks, um, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, and what they wanted to do with the federal government, that is to say, restrict it to a certain extent. And, and again, uh, Eric stole my thunder on, on this, and so did Kurt. There's Justice Kennedy, and here's the language. And you have to ask, gosh, this was coming in 2010. Is this, uh, 2011 rather, is this a hint in which way this man wants to go? Federalism is more than an exercise in setting the boundary between different institutions of government for their own integrity. State sovereignty, the dual sovereignty system, federalism, is not just an end in itself. Rather, federalism secures to citizens the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power, Bond versus United States, 2011, just one year ago. Okay, put it a slightly different way, and I can't resist this even though uh, everybody does it. The question to ask is, if the individual mandate is upheld, what then is there that the federal government can't do, and in particular, can they make us buy green cars, or worse, green vegetables? Um, and I think it's a real, a real concern. But, and again, here's the irony that's been pounded all through the morning. The truth of the matter is there is clearly some Commerce Clause precedent which supports this. There is, of course, Wickard versus Filburn that tells us that Congress could regulate wheat production on a family farm that was intended for use strictly on that farm. I'm informed that it actually was a big business enterprise, that farm, but still, the wheat was consumed only on that farm, and the court said, nevertheless, it affects interstate commerce, and therefore, it ought to be able to be regulated by the federal government. That's the high watermark, and yet, as recently as 2005, and those of us who wonder whether Justice Scalia is going to, in fact, vote to overturn the individual mandate have to be troubled by this case. In Gonzalez versus Raich, we learn Congress can criminalize the production and use of homegrown cannabis even where states approve its use for medicinal purposes. Now, contrast those two cases, and everybody does. Everybody talks about only the four cases that I'm mentioning now. Contrast those with United States versus Lopez, in which in 1995, for the very first time, very first time, first case since the New Deal to restrict Congress's power, the court rules that the Gun-Free School Zones Act which prohibited the carrying of firearms within a thousand feet of any school, that the Commerce Clause cannot be used to justify that. Now, you all know the Commerce Clause argument in that case boiled down to its essentials. It was, well, you know, if you're disturbed by guns in school, you can't learn, and if you can't learn, you're not gonna be able to produce, and that's gonna lessen interstate commerce. Um, it's a bit of a fanciful argument. The court struck it down. United States versus Morrison, same thing, the Federal Violence Against Women Act can't be justified under the Commerce Clause on the theory that violence against women might somehow infringe their ability to participate in interstate commerce. So there are limits. Now, what does it mean? What do these limits mean? 
and what can we say? Again, this has been hinted at so far, but let's make it explicit. I think it means two things when we're trying to figure out what do we do in this situation that we're in. Item one, there has to be some limits on federal power. The Tenth Amendment can't be obliterated. It can't be reduced to a complete melody. Second, the police power. The police power must still primarily remain in the state government. So those are our two guides. So that leads you to the question, where then do you draw the line? And this we haven't talked about too much today. I think one plausible way to draw the line, because I don't know where to draw the line, I'm not sure anybody does, is what this guy did. That's Judge Roger Vinson, the federal district court judge. He's pictured with one of his uh, beloved camellias. He is, in fact, the president of the American Camellia Association. That has nothing to do with anything I'm saying, but I'm charmed by that. <laughs> sort of the way Randy uh, liked the device he talked about. Um, judge Roger Vinson in the Florida case decided, well, okay, the distinction we're going to draw is the active-inactive distinction. In Wickard versus Filburn, they were growing wheat. In Raich, they were growing cannabis. But here, they're not doing anything. The po folks that you want to compel to buy insurance have chosen not to. That's inactivity. That can't be regulated. Now, he was affirmed on other grounds by the 11th Circuit, but put a slightly different way. Maybe the point simply is, when the federal government seeks to take over one-sixth of the economy, it eviscerates the Tenth Amendment, and it goes too far. I don't know. Maybe it's like uh, obscenity. You know it when you see it, but this must be going much, much too far. We did allude earlier this morning, and I'll begin to close uh, with this. We did allude as well to other considerations that we might regard as somewhat illegitimate. That's uh, Mr. Dooley. And you'll remember it's Mr. Dooley uh, who made the famous statement. He's a creation of Finley Peter Dunn, a Chicago satirist. And Mr. Dooley is the one who first said, the Supreme Court follows the election returns. And he was thinking about Franklin Roosevelt's victory in 1936 and the court's famous switch in time that saved nine and that preserved at least the second New Deal. It is quite possible, and Randy alluded to this at the end of the last section, it is quite possible that the court will say, well, gosh, the 2010 election was a referendum on the individual mandate. If the American people are persuaded it's a good thing, why should we be? Could tip, could tip the balance. Further, the latest polls, we found this one out two days ago. The uh, poll, I think it was from the Associated Press, says that 67% of the American people believe the court should overturn the whole law or the individual mandate. And you'll remember that Judge Vincent overturned the whole law, just not the individual mandate. For realists, as, as Randy described them before, there's one more interesting thing out there. And that one more interesting thing is that the legal arguments that the government is making in support of the act keep shifting. Originally, it was a Commerce Clause argument. Then it was a taxing power argument, which had the inconvenient feature of pointing out that the president and the defenders of the act had told the American people, no, 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 that's not a tax. But in order to support it, suddenly it's a tax. And then finally, the last argument that we've heard a fair amount about lately, the necessary and proper clause argument. You ought to be able to do it, even if, strictly speaking, it's not interstate commerce. I think these are all not particularly convincing arguments. And it strikes me that if you really believe in judicial engagement, then this is the time to engage. This is the time, I think, to strike it down. And I'm done. I want to begin by expressing my own gratitude to Professor Price Foey for um, inviting me. This is a very, very interesting conference. Uh, I presume I was invited because she presumed I might disagree with some of the things that have been said, and I certainly do disagree with what Professor Presser has said, but I must say I really don't think that I have anything new to add to the arguments. I will simply say, whether it's the devil quoting scripture or not, read Jeff Sutton's Sixth Circuit opinion or Lawrence Silberman's DC Circuit opinion, uh, which I find you know, high examples of judicial craft, which I presume is not true of some of you in this room. 
uh, but they're your judges, <laughs> uh, by and large. Um, what also the uh, even though I told Elizabeth originally that I didn't have time to prepare a real paper, once I read um, Government Unchecked, The False Problem of Judicial Activism, The Need for Judicial Engagement, uh, my juices got stirred up, so I've ended up submitting a paper, which as is true of occasions like this, is too long to read in full, though I'm delighted to learn very unusually that actually there will be only about a three-month gap between giving the paper and its publication. Usually with law reviews, it's somewhere between nine months and two years. Um, so, you know, all of these arguments will be spelled out uh, and made thoroughly convincing for those of you who may have some <laughs> doubts, um, um, you know, in, in a journal coming out shortly. Uh, let me thus go over rather quickly the point about judicial activism, judicial restraint, because quite frankly, I don't see anybody on the current court who can be described as a devotee of judicial restraint. Uh, they are all activists. Uh, they're simply activists in different directions. Uh, Jeff Rosen uh, said literally just this past Sunday, not at all coincidentally, reviewing a new book by J. Harvey Wilkinson uh, from Your Own Circuit, um, uh, attacking what he calls global constitutional theory, um, which is a pox on both your houses, that is, uh, conservative originalists and uh, liberal unenumerated rights type. Uh, but what Jeff wrote is, quote, not a single justice exemplifies uh, this tradition, that is the tradition associated with Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was on Steve's um, had photograph, uh, or Felix Frankfurter. Um, they're gone, gone, gone. Uh, now, why might that be the case? Uh, let me suggest it was because uh, Justice Holmes was a near nihilist in view of his um, uh, you know, overall uh, social philosophy, particularly the role of courts. Um, um, what he wrote in the common law, the first requirement of a sound body of law is that it should correspond with the actual feelings and demands of the community, whether right or wrong. He introduces Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws, where he defined the, quote, proximate test of excellence um, as, quote, the correspondence to the actual equilibrium of force in the community, that is, conformity to the wishes of the dominant power, unquote. Uh, to adopt the view of my colleague at the University of Texas, uh, Scott Poe, uh, this basically does view the court as the um, handmaiden of the dominant hegemon. Uh, there might, in fact, be some lags in this if you have judges from the old order who gamely try to hang on, but by and large, the role of the judge is to figure out who's in control and to do what they want. Um, as he says um, in the Lochner dissent, uh, the proximate test of a good government is that the dominant power has its way. Um, um, actually, that's not uh, from Lochner. I think it's from the path of the law. Then finally, and for some people most memorably, he writes to Harold Lasky, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them. It's my job, unquote. Um, I think that an earlier generation, that is the progressive generation, the New Deal generation, found these comments to have a consider to have much more brio and persuasiveness um, before World War II and before the rise of truly evil and tyrannical regimes than, um, uh, than afterward. So when Holmes says in Lochner, who really cares if a law is tyrannical, uh, the question is, does it represent the view of a dominant majority? That sort of view for many, many people, as I say, has less purchase. Um, that I think most of us, uh, again, whatever our notional politics, have some view that one thing that courts can and should do is to protect us from tyranny. What we disagree, obviously, is what counts as tyranny. Uh, but the idea that a judge should be completely and utterly indifferent to whether law is tyrannical, as I say, I think doesn't have 
much purchase on us today, and I don't think it has any purchase on any member of the current court. Um, uh, you know, Steve is the Rao Berger professor at Northwestern. I think the kind of Holmesian, Frankfurterian judicial restraint uh, that I think um, Rao Berger, whom I had the privilege of meeting on several occasions, and the privilege of being attacked by him uh, when I seem to be actually defending some kind of judicial activism, but that spirit or the spirit of my own colleague, Lino Gralia, I think they're, um, uh, they have no representatives on the uh, contemporary court. Uh, we disagree uh, among ourselves in this room, no doubt, on which particular decisions exemplify uh, judges on a rampage and which decisions exemplify engaged justices defending the cause of liberty. Uh, it may be a little bit, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato, or potato or potato. Uh, so we can have Lawrence versus Texas, Citizens United, Heller, um, and other recent cases of the Supreme Court that I have no doubt divide many of us in this room, but surely it's not on the basis that any of these decisions or a whole host of other decisions could be plausibly described as a judicially restrained court uh, that is just submitting to whatever it is the political branches uh, want. Uh, now, you know, one possible reaction, but I think that Mark Tushnet and perhaps Lino Gralia are um, outliers on this, would simply be to get rid of judicial review entirely. Um, if you don't want to get rid of judicial review entirely, then it's got to be the case, as an analytic truth, that judges should engage with the Constitution and interpret it honestly, um, and then we, you know, we go off and debate about what that means. Um, in any event, that's the first part of my paper. Uh, for more um, on this, uh, do uh, rush to get your issue of the George Mason Law Review in about uh, three months. The next point, though, I want to engage is with is some particular issues involving protection of state autonomy that is federalism against overreach by the national government. I believe that it should be for, at least for a textualist, maybe originalists are different, but at least for a textualist, I think it is an embarrassment that the national constitution contains almost no explicit um, uh, protections of state autonomy. You can look at a bunch of other national constitutions around the world that say, for example, that education should be reserved to subnational units or control the environment or interestingly enough control over language or control over uh, literally state religions. We don't have that. Uh, states do have autonomy rights to prevent them from being mushed together as I personally would do in a second with the two Dakotas and turn them into one state um, or split up uh, to allow a more civic republican kind of um, government because they're just too large and one can think of California or my own state of Texas. But the one thing we know is that the national government can't do that on its own, uh, that the Constitution guarantees to the states a veto right. But you can pour through the Constitution at length and find very, very few other explicit limitations. So basically what you have to do is to agree with John Marshall in the now questioned uh, McCulloch versus Maryland decision where he admits in part two of McCulloch that he's deciding the case not on the basis of text but on texture. Uh, that is a structural reading of the Constitution which he ultimately says that what he calls jokingly or not the sovereign state of Maryland in the first sentence of the opinion can't tax a national bank. You then get other textural decisions like, say, New York versus United States, which is not one of my own favorites, but it rests on constitutional text, or for that matter, I would even argue, original intent, no more than the second part of McCulloch. It rests on judges making a highly debatable, that is, reasonable people can debate about it, 
reading of how this complex institution called federalism could mesh. With regard to James Madison, incidentally, you can quote him on all sides of this issue. Uh, the Tenth Federalist is not a pay on to federalism. Uh, the whole point of the Tenth Federalist is that you're much more likely to get tyranny at the local level of government than you are in the extended republic. And he has a whole argument about how factions work, and it, this will be translated very easily into modern social choice theory, that it's easier to capture a state than it is to capture the entire national government, though to be sure, if you capture the entire national government, you'll get a better payoff for your investment. Uh, but still, it's gonna be hard to do. Then in 1798, Madison becomes much more of a state's rights buff, um, uh, and you, know, you can find, but then when uh, Calhoun suggests that 1798 uh, actually may support secession, he says, oh no, I never ever meant to say that states could ultimately play the trump of saying that you're violating this deal that was made and when you violate it uh, sufficiently, we're gonna slam the door and leave. Um, so, you know, I think that Madison is what literary theorists would call an unreliable narrator with regard to uh, what the Constitution um, uh, can or uh, should mean. Um, I will skip the section on the preamble, though I'm one of those people who finds the preamble to this Constitution and other Constitutions extremely interesting, and I believe that if you're going to engage with the Constitution, it would be a good idea to engage with the preamble and to take seriously what establishing justice might be, but also securing the blessings of liberty or uh, the common defense. And then, of course, one of the things you discover is that there might be some tension uh, among these. And part of, one of the things we're talking about is who gets to resolve those tensions with regard to limiting certain blessings of liberty in order to establish a greater degree of social justice for some of us, that's what the Affordable Care Act debate is about. Or with regard to the Patriot Act, um, which could be thought to violate the First Amendment in a variety of ways, um, if you read the text in a certain way, for that matter, if you read James Madison in a certain way, uh, nonetheless, the defense of something like the Patriot Act is that we need it in order to engage in the common defense. In the remainder of my time, though, what I want to do is to change the subject somewhat, or at least shift the discussion. It's not really changing the subject. Let us assume that you, when I use this word advisedly, do want to enhance federalism, mean, meaning the protection of state autonomy, uh, more than I might. Uh, for the rest of my remarks, it really doesn't matter whether you know, I am a big federalism buff or not, rather what I'm doing is putting on uh, my hat as a political scientist and as somebody who is increasingly interested in constitutional design. Uh, and the, the only error, and it's a, you know, in this context, um, it, it's worth pointing out that I do have a new book that is literally, the official publication date is April 2nd, called Framed, colon, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. Um, and it talks very much about basic structural aspects of the United States Constitution and the constitutions that most elite law schools simply ignore. That is state constitutions, uh, which I think are far, far more interesting than uh, the legal academy thinks they are. Um, and I think they do provoke a whole set of questions about how one might want to design a constitution if you are motivated in order to protect certain values. And let's stipulate for the remainder of my remarks that one of those values is protection of state autonomy against a, a federal government which can be predicted to try to overreach, uh, just as states, incidentally, can be predicted to try to shirk. Um, you know, this is a basic uh, issue. Uh, the incentives do not necessarily map up with promises that might have been made in 1787 or elsewhere that boil down to trust us. 
we will never overreach, and we as states will always submit to legitimate demands of the national government. Uh, Madison and the 48th Federalists said these are all parchment barriers. And so what you need to do is to try to construct institutions that arguably will lead to a greater likelihood of protecting the values you're committed to uh, because promises really are made to be broken, frankly. That is one of the things we learn in life. So how might you design the United States Constitution to be more federalism friendly if in fact it is a demonstrable truth not necessarily that the Constitution correctly understood isn't federalism friendly. I don't think it is particularly. Some of you disagree, but I presume that one of the things that most of us do agree on is that the Supreme Court has not really been, over its history, a firm friend of state autonomy against what is thought to be an overreaching uh, federal government. And of course, the most notable decisions in McCulloch, but you know, we have Reich, we have decisions uh, you know, most literally in, in the last several years. Now, Professor um, um, Foley Price and I, Price Foley, I forget, were in a debate in the Tennessee Law Review about Randy's repeal amendment. Uh, and I've been correctly quoted saying that it's a terrible idea that two-thirds of the states would be able to repeal uh, national legislation. But the reason I think it's a terrible idea is because I think one of the terrible features about the Constitution is the excess of power it gives small states, like the Dakotas. Um, if Randy's proposal were sensibly modified to say that three quarters, or for that matter, even a majority of the states representing, say, 60% or maybe even 50% of the population. Or I actually like some aspect of direct democracy. I like Maine and Ohio and actually parts of California. And so instead of having lawyers shout at one another next uh, week for six hours of what will persuade almost nobody in the national audience, because our minds really are made up uh, if we're following this at all closely, let's put it to a vote. Let's do what they did in Maine or Ohio. And instead of having the lawyers' arguments, find out if people would, in fact, vote to repeal. I wouldn't vote to repeal it. But if one is a little d Democrat, then maybe it should be submitted to popular vote. One of the things, of course, that's true about the United States Constitution is that there's not an iota of direct democracy in it. If you look at the 50 state constitutions, only one constitution, Delaware's, and not coincidentally, it's one of the very old constitutions, also doesn't have any direct democracy. For all of the others, from Maine to California to Hawaii, they include some aspect of direct democracy, and some of them are really very generous in their notion of direct democracy. Um, um, uh, so, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which I might sign on to the repeal amendment, but not one that gives excessive power to the two Dakotas, uh, Wyoming, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, th this does suggest uh, a way, uh, you know, if you believe that the national government can't really be trusted and that the federal courts can't really be trusted. And why would you uh, trust the federal courts? Um, you know, the quick and easy answer is to point out what Madison said um, in the Kentucky, uh, in the Virginia Resolution, or what John Calhoun said. And by citing Calhoun, I really don't mean to be discrediting the argument. Uh, I think Carl Schmitt is a very, very interesting jurisprudential figure, and he was a Nazi. Um, so, uh, you know, Calhoun was a very smart guy who had some real insights. Um, and both Madison uh, and Calhoun agreed that it was unlikely that a federal judiciary appointed by the national government would be particularly friendly to monitoring um, uh, potential overreach uh, by the 
national government. Uh, what Madison writes, the states being the parties to the constitutional compact, that's obviously the very controversial theory of 1798, and in their sovereign capacity, it follows of necessity that there can be no tribunal above their authority to decide in the last resort whether the compact made by them be violated, unquote. To allow the Supreme Court to decide such issues would, in effect, be to allow the national government to be the judge of its own powers. What Calhoun says is that it is hazardous, um, and I must say fatal, that's Calhoun's language, to give, quote, to the general government the sole and final right of interpreting the Constitution, unquote. Uh, so Calhoun develops first the fantasy of nullification, um, and then ultimately, of course, the argument for secession. Um, now, you know, let me say that these are serious arguments, and you don't have to go all the way to being a secessionist to say, well, perhaps if we ever did have a new constitutional convention that I'm one of the few people who actually supports, uh, maybe it would be worth having a real debate about how we select federal judges and for how long they should serve independently of what the Constitution should say textually. Uh, one might imagine, for example, as a thought experiment, uh, that at least some judges would be appointed by state officials. Um, one would, I mean, this is the, the argument against the 17th Amendment. Uh, the 17th Amendment does in the argument the Senate has anything to do with protecting federalism. The modern Senate is an affirmative action program for the residents of small states and nothing else. Um, if presumably we got rid of the 17th Amendment, returned to state legislative appointment plus recall should senators um, violate uh, their commands from the state legislature sent them, then you could make a plausible argument that the Senate would have something to do with federalism. Now, not surprising that I'd oppose this, uh, just as I would be at least wary about doing what most states do in the country, which is to elect judges, or at least having appointed judges subject to an electoral um, um, uh, uh, retention campaigns. Or you could imagine what Teddy Roosevelt suggested 100 years ago, that you don't have to fire the judge, but that there should be mechanisms to override Supreme Court decisions. Canada has this. Um, um, you know, it's certainly thinkable. As I say, I might support these or not. Some of my support um, or opposition might be based on very abstract theories of how to design a government. But probably more to the point is that I would make certain predictions as to what the relationship is between given structures and the likelihood of generating results that I would like. Um, and so it does seem to me that you know, if you are appalled by what the national government has been doing, appalled by what the federal courts have been upholding, then really and truly, um, we should, if not completely stop, but we should interrupt the arguments we have about the one true way to interpret the Constitution. I think Kurt Lash is absolutely correct. There is no one true way to interpret anything that actually gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, um, and uh, instead to talk about design aspects that might be more relevant in protecting whatever your favorite values. And given um, you know, the venue, I'm willing to play the thought of experiment of what if my own favorite value were protecting state autonomy and federalism. These are the sorts of things I would encourage you to think about rather than calling for the overruling of McCulloch versus Maryland. Well, I too am very grateful to the Institute for Justice and to the George Mason Law Review and all of you to, for your welcome here today. Uh, many interesting things have said, been said, uh, including we now know that Judge Vincent is president of the Camellia uh, Society. 
Uh, many of you probably think uh, I was president of the Chameleon Society, uh, having spent part of my life as a Reagan Republican and now uh, most recently as President Obama's supporter and uh, recent ambassador to the Republic of Malta, one of the world's largest republics. Um, not really, of course. Um, <laughs> You, you wonder what the president is saying to you after you help him win four states in the election campaign, and he says, I'm going to send you to a remote island. Um, you don't know if that's good or bad. But the, uh, I, I, I'd like to start by um, reminding us that there's a couple of different things on our table that we need to think about, that we've been invited to think about. Part of the invitation, and indeed the one that I paid most close attention to for purposes of writing for the review, was this concept of judicial engagement and whether it is different than the notion of judicial activism. Uh, my own uh, very erudite son wrote a very interesting history of judicial activism for the University of California Law Review when he was a student at Berkeley. And uh, uh, so he knows everything there is about activism, but one of the things that he points out in that article is that the original terminology of activism was meant as a compliment. Uh, it was not meant as a criticism. And it seems to me that one of the things that Clark and his colleagues, Clark Neely and his colleagues have done uh, at the Institute for Justice is what the Institute for Justice does so wonderfully, and that is it looks out there at the real world, at the facts, and says, hey, you know, Everybody moans about this, uh, this usurping of executive and legislative authority by the judiciary, but let's really count the numbers. You know, Something all of us could do, but only the Institute for Justice actually does. And when they count the numbers, they demonstrate in a very nice, concrete way that the number of times in which courts have actually overruled the legislative handiwork or set aside or displaced the executive is really quite small. Now, I fuss a little bit with the way in which they do their accounting in my paper, and I'll let you read it in the very fast production. Uh, and I know how they get it done fast. I've never had law review editors be quite as demanding as the George Mason law review editors, but always with a smile and always being the first to help. Uh, and, uh, but they really do stay on a timetable, and indeed, if I could elect them, uh, I, I think I would solve much of the nation's angst. Um, the, um, but what the Institute for Justice does in their study here in switching the terminology from activism to engagement, in demonstrating the empirical uh, smallness of the number of occasions in which uh, the judiciary has actually overstepped its bounds is to, of course, open the door again to ask us to, uh, to, to ask the question that the late, lovely Bernie Segan always asked, why is it that you know, only the civil liberties are protected uh, with close scrutiny? Why isn't it economic liberty? Why isn't it the vocation of calling uh, and you know the person that what, how much time we spend in you know our our life at work, right? That how much we the first question we ask someone is, hey, what do you do, right? And that question defines us as a human person, and how important the definition of that is for liberty, right? Because we want in our system of government not just freedom to do anything. We want freedom to do good. We want freedom to manifest our personality in a way that's creative and constructive and lasting as a legacy. And that's the great thing about the Institute for Justice because it has taken this commitment to freedom and it has matched it with a, with a population uh, segment that is often overlooked uh, namely those at the fringes of society, those who have very little in the way of, of beginning capital, but nevertheless have that gumption, have that willingness to extend their personality into the hair braiding business or into the taxi business, or like Nurse Kilo to say, boy, I don't have all the money in the world, but I found this wonderful house with an aspect 
of the water and I'm going to turn this Victorian into a place that people, when they walk by in, in New London, will say, wow, that's a great house and that's a responsible citizen. And the Institute for Justice, by melding the concept of freedom and enterprise and, pro and the protection of property, illustrates over and over again in every one of its cases why however good footnote four is in a small way, and it is correct to a point, right? It is correct to a point to be concerned about the skewing of the political process, and if the political process is skewed, to put close scrutiny on that. It is correct to the point where someone is of a minority status and they have been consistently uh, and systematically put to the uh, outside of, of, the, of the benefits of living in, in our civil order to pay close attention to that. All of that in Justice Stone's footnote four is fine. What's wrong is what they leave out and the significance of what they leave out. And so what I would suggest to you is let's not leave that significance out this afternoon as we think about whether or not the Patient Care Act or Obamacare Act or whatever its formal title is should be upheld or not, or what the, uh, how it is that we come to analyze that. You know, I'm going to be bold enough to suggest that there is more common ground between the Occupy movement and the Tea Party movement than meets the eye. I think both movements feel betrayed. I think both movements feel that the government that they live within, under, is one that is not responsive to who they are. And they may see themselves quite differently, and I suspect they do. And indeed, I suspect the Tea Party folks tend to see themselves as states' writers, as pushing things down more closely. You know, the idea of if you've, you know, I, and I love this, I, this is one of the things that attracted me to Ronald Reagan, you know, his ability to say, you know, in five words, neighborhood, peace, work, freedom, right? When he picked out, I only got four of them, but the, uh, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that he, when he started with neighborhood, he started at the exact right level. He started at the level that the human mind can comprehend. And so did our founders. You know? I often ask my students, what is this thing, a constitution? You know, and I get rule book answers and so forth and all sorts of legalisms already. You know, right there in the first year, they're already lawyers. And, and, and one of them is calling me now. Excuse me, I have to turn this off. And, uh, but the answer is given by James Madison, right? He says, the Constitution is a sublime reflection on human nature. It's a reflection on human nature. It explains us to us. It is a picture of us. And I think what the Tea Party and the Occupy movement is saying is the creation that exists now as a government is not us. It either is not us because somehow this government that you've created allowed large numbers of bankers to pretend that they were appraising properties when they never even bothered to do a basic appraisal, and then package them all up in creative instruments called credit default swaps, which were nothing more than Ponzi insurance schemes, and infected the entire universe with their malfeasance. It's not us, because to the extent that the government is supposed to be protecting our initiative and our investment and our property, it failed us badly. Now, is that a failure of regulation or is that a failure of overregulation? There you get great political debates that will go on at this institution and other institutions for a great many days. And it should continue to go on. But it nevertheless is properly focused on the fact that it's a failure of human uh, to pay attention to the aspect
of uh, human nature. And that's what I do in my paper, to, and it's, it's styled Engaging Human Nature in Support of Judicial Engagement. And it, it I, I won't, you'll all be able, as I say, to read it instantaneously. Um, but the, it goes through the standard things that you know, Clark and Steve advocate for, and, and those are good instruments, namely a closer evaluation of regulatory means, a closer evaluation of ends, a matching, a nexus between means and ends. I illustrate how, you know, even though that was given up in Lochner for economic purposes, that there have been some recent suggestions by progressive members of the court, I actually love the terminology, Justice Breyer in particular in the copyright cases, where he kind of outlines in his dissents, uh, you know, a, a greater role for the court in terms of evaluation of economic questions like the questions that we're talking about uh, today. Uh, but then I suggest something that science tells us and something that James Wilson, that wonderful exponent of the natural law, that delegate to the Constitutional Convention who did those, you'll remember those famous lectures on the Constitution years ago when I was a student. And, all right, I'll wait for the translation for the laugh. Uh, all right, very good. Um, this is why I'm no longer ambassador. And, uh, but Wilson pointed out to us that it may be true that human nature is timeless. There's a debate about that. Because after all, Darwin is in essence a debate about that. The survival of the fittest suggests that we're becoming more fit, not just biologically fit, but mentally fit. And that to some degree our natures are an improved product in 2012 than they were in 1789. Again, a vibrant debate can be had. But there's an awful lot of neurobiological science and writing going on out there that can't just be ignored that tells us more about human nature and James Wilson told us at the at the founding that we should pay attention to that because he himself admitted that he would know less at that moment about human nature than what we would know today and if that's the case then we need to pay some close attention as we analyze our Supreme Court jurisprudence and the responsiveness of our Constitution to what it is that we want them to be responsive to. And here's some writing from 1926. It is evident a Constitution must accommodate the competing interests of the individual and the individual's community. It is evident, therefore, that in any complex organization like human society, something must be freely granted to the individual. Something must be freely granted to the individual. The people at the Institute for Justice are gulping. No, a great deal should be granted freely to the individual, they are saying in their minds. But the Obama folks who didn't get word of the meeting are saying the opposite. They're out there at the bus stops. This is what we mean politically by liberty. On the other hand, something must be insisted on for the benefit of the group. Those, those are the Obama folks. They're phoning in their comments. This is what we mean by law in a social sense. Social progress depends upon the just balance between the two. Without liberty, there is no initiative. Without liberty, there's no initiative. And hence, no progress. Without law, there is no survival of the group. Now, so I, I would suggest to us as we analyze the legislation that the Supreme Court has before it and we consider the case law as it exists, that we not just think of this as a case of liberty versus heavy handedness. We not just think of this as a case of what is national and what is local but that we ask ourselves fundamentally, first of all, who we are as a people, which is what Madison did, right? And Madison did what when he discovered what about the human personality? He, he discovered that we were greatly flawed. 
And by virtue of that, of the flaw, right, the flaw that pushes us to grasp ever more power, he divided up power through the separation of powers and through federalism in order to preserve liberty. Are we as flawed in 2012 as we were in 1789? Are we more flawed, less flawed? The neuroscience tends to indicate that we're becoming a more altruistic people. You're more generous in your hearts. Ask yourselves, I'm not going to parade you up and down on the stage. But if that's true, if you're more generous in your hearts, is there a larger or a smaller role for government as a consequence? Because it can go either way, it seems to me, in terms of the argument. And Clark and Steve will want to immediately say, that means men are angels and or getting closer to that angelic status. And we know what Madison told us would be true about government if men were angels. Don't need it. Less is more. The folks over at in the White House over there, wherever it is over there, I guess, and is, they're probably saying, no, you know, we see this government instrument as something that can be an instrument for the good. And since we're all so angelic, we'll just get down to business. Get me Boehner on the phone. And that's the conversation. So let me end my little homily about this by focusing on the case law. I heard Steve, my good colleague, uh, with whom I uh, share the editing responsibilities for a case book. Everybody's getting plugs in on books, so I'm going to give. And uh, at first, when I was only a Reaganite, and Steve and I started this project, people said, oh, it is a very one-sided book you've got there. Well, see, I've now brought balance to the book. But, the, uh, but Steve mentioned that he thought, and I thought that he's, he did this in a nice understated way, he said, I think there's some case law out there that would, you know, would suggest the support for the law. And you mentioned Wickard. Not just some case law, all of it. Wickard, Raish, Justice Scalia's, extended disquisition on the necessary and proper clause, to read that in any way to suggest serious doubt about the constitutionality of this health legislation is to suggest that you're not reading the case. Now, I know our friend uh, Randy, uh, who's mooting somewhere at the moment, uh, is mooting the issue of how this is dramatically different because this is inactivity. And this is the first time in the world, in the world's history, that government has made us do something we don't want to do. I don't know about you, that doesn't ring real true to me. I mean, it may be true that they haven't swooped into my kitchen and forced broccoli down my throat. But the fact of the matter is calling this inactivity is a bit of a ruse because the uninsured consumed last year approximately $116 billion in health care services. And insofar as the uninsured are consuming $116 billion in health care services, it is a very active choice on their part whether or not to pay for that through their own responsibility and their own acquisition of insurance or by self-insuring. And I can tell you, I know a good number of people who consciously look at that choice and say, we will self-insure as long as we can. And we will buy in at the last moment. And that is a very active economic commercial decision. And it is exactly the kind of decision, if not more, than the consumption decision made by farmer Filburn in Wickard versus Filburn. And it is certainly far more impacting upon the substantial effect on interstate commerce than anything Ange poor Angela Raish with her terribly painful brain tumor was, suffer was suffering. So it seems to me that if we're honest about the case law,
that it's, it is largely lined up on the side of upholding the statute. Now, is that good or bad in terms of the case law? That's an entirely different, that, that's, maybe that's this symposium too, but it it's a, it's a, would take longer to address. But let me just point out to you one thing. One of the things we've always said as critics of the ever-expanding commerce power, and I'm one of those folks who you know, mocks the commerce power and its size in, in, my, in my classes, is to go back and ask, how did we get this notion that it was totally limitless? Why didn't, we get, why didn't we get better line drawing out of those wonderful framers, those founders, those wise people who got together in Philadelphia and put up with Heat and Franklin? Um, why didn't we have that? Because what got sent to the Committee on Style was an instruction that said, don't give me a definition of the commerce power, give me a provision that divides that which is national from that which is local. And that's what Marshall reminds us of in Gibbons versus Ogden, that fundamentally when you come to these difficult questions between what belongs in the national government and what belongs in the state government, you have to answer the question, what can be done only nationally and what can be done more effectively locally? And it seems to me one of the things that the briefing has done in the case is to demonstrate that I should please wrap up, but also to demonstrate that uh, any experiment to try and undertake the kinds of reforms that are in that legislation that has, have been done locally have always unraveled because of the race to the bottom, meaning fundamentally that what is national there is the types of reforms that were undertaken. All the other issues could be addressed uh, in terms of uh, the Anti-Injunction Act and the severability. Uh, it's, uh, it's clearly severable in my judgment. It, is, uh, it looks like a tax, but it's called a penalty. Uh, I, I think the court might might, if it decides that it doesn't have the votes it wants for a particular outcome, might call it a tax, in which case they might jump away from the case on jurisdictional grounds, in which case we would all be left saying, oh, gee, that's like kissing your sister. But one way or the other, I don't think you're going to see an invalidation of the law. But more importantly, I ask you as you think about judicial engagement and you think about whether this law is a good one or a bad one, whether it advances human nature or detracts from it. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all to our panelists. It's very interesting. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions, but I think first I may take the, the moderator's prerogative and, and pose the first question, if that's okay. Um, from what all of you have said, th there are obviously many contested views. We have contested views about, um, as Professor Kamika said, human nature, right? whether human nature is improving and um, in what direction it might be improving or whether it's improving at all. Um, we have conflicting views about federalism, about the structure of the Constitution, about methods of interpretation. And you know, more specifically, we have conflicts about whether the individual mandate is unconstitutional. So given all of these conflicts, um, what does that tell us about judicial engagement? If these, I guess there's a question first if these conflicts are reasonable? Are these reasonable disagreements about human nature and the Constitution? And if they are reasonable, what do we take from that for the question of judicial engagement? Um, I guess we come back to, to something that I was attempting to say in, in the presentation, and that is we're at a very interesting moment now in theory, it seems to me. And we're, we're looking at the product of 50 years teaching of legal realism in the law schools. And the, the theories, as Sandy says, don't seem to have uh, more validity than any of the rest of them. But we're at a moment where the court could actually clarify and where judicial engagement 
might actually have the result to bring this back to the rule of law. And I find that a very exciting one. I mean, if one reads Marbury, um, Marshall says the point of a written constitution is to remind us of certain basic commitments. But then the examples he gives, say the two witness rule and treason, really is the sort of thing that no reasonable person could get into shouting arguments about what it means. Uh, in this new book, which I'll flag once more, um, I distinguish very sharply between what I call the constitution of conversation and the constitution of settlement. And settlement has nothing to do with Hart and Sachs and you know, the role of the Supreme Court in clarifying something, and then the rest of us say, well, you know, that's that. Rather, it has to do with all those parts of the Constitution that are never litigated. Because there's really nothing to have good faith debates about with regard to meaning. My favorite example is Inauguration Day. Uh, and one of my favorite amendments is the 20th Amendment. Because I, I think it was really stupid to have March 4th as Inauguration Day, and we did something about it. My own view is that it's almost as stupid to wait till January 20th to inaugurate a new president. But the one thing we know is that we're not going to get into debates about interpreting what January 20th means. And so there's a huge difference between you know, what part of two senators of each state or what part of three quarters of the states formally to ratify an amendment or two witnesses for treason do you not understand as against the constitution of conversation where we say, well, we really don't know what this means. There are good faith arguments on both sides, and we really want the court to clarify it. And the obvious question is, why do we think the court is capable of truly ending that conversation? I mean, the historical record suggests that they rarely end conversations about things that are felt deeply in society at large. I mean, the court has tried to end the conversation on abortion uh, probably half a dozen times, most notably in Casey, where the whole point of the plurality opinion is we're the Supreme Court, we have spoken, we've clarified this, now the rest of you just shut up. And it didn't work. And why would we think a five to four decision would really resolve it because if President Obama wins and if one of the stipulated five gets off the court, you can bet the ranch that he, and it would be he, would be replaced by somebody who thinks, as Doug and I do, uh, frankly. And you know maybe it would be hard to get the votes to repass it, and then we could get into truly high theory arguments about whether a decision striking it down would kill it. And so it would have to be repassed or simply put it in a state of suspended animation to be revived when a different court said, you know, by a five to four vote, we've changed our mind. <laughs> and of course, Congress has the power to do this. I, I think the bewildering thing for me, Naomi, is why the court took it. You know, it, the answer is it only needs four votes. And the four votes that you know, they, they got for, in my mind, for, for certain, are the four votes that are going to see themselves eclipsed in the second term by someone else. So this is sort of their, their last moment as conductors of the train. And they were going to move the train as fast as they could in their direction you know, if they could get away with it. Uh, I think they now have the case. And if I'm correct in my assessment of the case law, they've discovered that there's less there than they hoped would meet the eye in terms of arguments to help the four that want to, that want to preserve their mark. And, uh, you know, now, now they're stuck with it. That's why I think they might take the Anti-Injunction Act jurisdictional question as a way out, um, if, especially if they're not going to get the kind of opinion that uh, is, is going to do anything in terms of clarifying federal versus local power. Thank you. I'll, that would open up to the audience for questions. 
This is a reaction to, I think it was Professor Levinson's second point about uh, federalism and text and texture. I guess I see a lot of the doctrines, uh, like the uh, 11th Amendment doctrine and the 10th Amendment doctrine, as grounded in text ultimately. And let me just pitch out the case. So the Constitution, um, uh, Mike Rappaport made this point, that, that when the Constitution uses the word state, you have to understand state as a term of art, meaning something that's a nation in most respects, except the, the, for the sovereignty given up to the federal government of the Constitution. And then the fact that Article I, Section 1 specifies that Congress's legislative powers are those, only those herein granted, kind of confirms that the states have this pre-existing pre pre sovereignty. And then following people like uh, Gary Lawson, the Necessary and Proper Clause requires that when Congress tries to pass ancillary or implementing legislation, it has to show that the law is proper in the sense that it preserves the relationship between these mostly sovereign states and the new federal government in a manner that respects the prerogatives in the sense that one enforces unmistakably clear parts of the Constitution and refrains from filling in gaps like those, then I take your point. But if one is an originalist in the sense that the, the Constitution has a meaning and the, the, some provisions, they're not clear in their face, but the, the implications are reasonably clear once you think about the entire structure and words like state and context, then there's not the separation between text and texture that, I, that you were mentioning. I must say, at least in this sense at this moment, I'm a John Manning textualist. Whatever the 11th Amendment means, textually, clearly, it does not prevent a citizen of a state suing uh, his or her own government. It says very clearly, I mean, it was designed textually to overrule Chisholm, which it does, and so what is called 11th Amendment doctrine, um, you know, is made up by the court in behalf of a structural theory of federalism which for sake of argument might be true, but it is it's a structural argument, it's not a textual argument. With regard to the 10th Amendment, I have to confess I'm with Justice Stone, I think it was Stone, who said it's a truism, that it says what hasn't been granted the national government is reserved to the states or the people. I can live with that. Uh, the debate is what's granted to the national government and you know, a kind of vulgar response is what part of Congress shall have the power to regulate interstate commerce do you not understand? Now, that's not a knockdown argument because we've had you know, 100 years of back and forth about you know, that part of the constitutional conversation, but the whole point of conversational arguments is that they're never ever gonna be brought to an end by the question, what part of X do you not understand? That will usually be viewed as an insult rather than a genuine attempt at clarification as might, as would be the case with inauguration day. Yes. <laughs> Let's assume sort of for the sake of the argument that the, the court upholds. Um, and let's also sort of assume that at least the, the founders themselves uh, believed that states had a sovereign sphere, and therefore there is some structure of federalism, whether it comes from the text alone or the context or the structure, however you want to uh, describe it. But there is a concept of federalism that was important to the founders, and, uh, and, and the Supreme Court itself has constantly at least given lip service to the idea of federalism. You need look no further than Bond uh, last summer. Okay, so if we, if we are really supposed to have a federalist structure and they, uh, they uphold the individual mandate, well, what does that mean for federalism going forward? How do we as constitutional law professors teach federalism? Because does not the, the commerce power, we've always believed that commerce power has become the functional equivalent of a police power, but now we really would know it, right? Would there be anything off limits to the commerce power? Um, is there a limiting principle? And if there's not a limiting principle, then what happened to federalism? Well, I think the answer that you know, we've been living with in the classroom has been that federalism has become, if not a truism, a, a, a politicalism, you know, which is what Justice Blackman, in changing his vote from one side in National League of Cities to the next, to the opposite side in 
uh, Garcia versus San Antonio Municipal Transit basically tells us. So it, 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 it reduced a structural precept to uh, a structural precept that's optional for an optional consideration for uh, the, the uh, members of Congress. Now, that antagonized, as you'll remember, Justice, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, and, and one of the most hardball, you know, fist-shaking statements. He said, federalism will come again, and I don't have to tell you how. It will just show up one day on your doorstep, and you'll have to live with it. Well, Clark's over here. He's going to keep federalism alive. It's on life support. <laughs> but my, my guess is, is that if, if Clark and his and the Mary Band of IJ lit litigators were in the room with the four conservative justices who were voting to grant this cert, one of the considerations they would have said was, you're jumping to the head of the class at a time when you need to build lots of infrastructure underneath. We've been building it in cases dealing with caskets and hair braiding and, and, and taxi cabs. You want to move it a little bit farther then, you know, here's a range of cases where, as I said in, in my little presentation, where economics as a matter, you know, in terms of the IJ's theme, could, could be uh, responded to as vocation. In the same way, the ability of the states to give honor to the human personality more specifically, more tangibly, more with greater variety would be, I think, part of the argument that IJ would make. And they would say, don't go to this big global you know, healthcare case and try and win it all at the, at the table when you haven't done your homework underneath. So I, I think as if you were a strategist and a teacher that favored a federalist structure, I think you would think a bit smaller and and proceed along those ways, at least suggest that it was still possible to do that. But it's only possible because the Institute for Justice is indefatigable. You know, they've got all this precedent against them. The contract clause no longer means, you know, no impairment. But they keep marching into court saying, oh, it means no impairment. Or they, they have the, all the precedent against the privileges and immunities. But they keep marching into court talking about privileges and immunities. Now, you know, it's amazing they don't get sanctioned all the time, but, they, um, <laughs> but they're brave and intrepid in that manner, and I think that's one way in which it would stay alive. I'm going to offer two brief comments on what the others just said. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting in the next five years to see how players line up on the contract clause when states try to reach the contracts of public employees. Um, I suspect that many, though maybe not all, political conservatives will think this is just fine because after all there's an economic crisis out there and it, it may well be true that my own pension helps to add to the problems facing the state of Texas. By the same token, I suspect that a number of political liberals might start disagreeing with the Cato Institute that there's something questionable about Blaisdell. Uh, but I think, it, as I say, you know, let, let's see what happens there. The other thing I would say, I don't think that one necessarily need interpret a decision like um, Garcia to say that federalism has no meaning. Rather, I think it's an institutional decision in which Justice Blackmun said, I think altogether plausibly, that we can't come up with any judicially manageable standards any more than we can do on pornography. Now, maybe you want to settle for something that we know a breach of federalism when we see it. Or you might say, well, it really should become part of the Constitution outside the courts, and we really should, this goes back to one of the arguments in the previous panel, we really should try to elect people. You know, Bob Dole used to read the Tenth Amendment every morning before the Senate met, and we really should try to inculcate that consciousness but that's because of a notion that, you know, uh, uh, that these sorts of judgment calls are for legislators to make. Um, you know, Marshall's view, and I'm not a, a huge Marshallian, but his view was that the Constitution should be viewed as an on-off switch. 
Um, uh, and that's what judges were good at. Uh, you know, he specifically said, you know, we shouldn't be making judgments about reasonableness. That's why you hire courts. And it seems to me the issue about how much should we honor the autonomy interests of local government um, because there are some values to it. I like decentralization, um, for example, which is different from federalism. And how much should we honor the claims of national government? Reasonable people can disagree. Uh, so you know, what is it that judges have useful to say? And one of the really pernicious things in the way we teach constitutional law is precisely the suggestion that if courts won't clarify it, then it has no meaning at all, rather than to say, well, courts are good at some things, but not particularly at other things, and this is one of the things they're not very good at. I, I have a brief comment. It seems to me you're asking exactly the right question. And uh, all through this debate, um, and, and they're noble things to say. I mean, I, I wanted to cry when Doug gave his speech, as I usually do. But, um, I have that effect. I know. Uh, e even so, nobody on the side who wants to uphold the act has been able to come up with a coherent set of limits that would still remain for the federal government. There's an apocryphal story uh, told, I think, about Ernie Brown, uh, a constitutional law professor at Harvard, uh, after reading a bunch of Warren Court decisions. He walked in to his constitutional law class through his constitutional law casebook at the podium, stalked out, and said, I'm going to start teaching tax law now. Uh, I will go to teach corporations if they uphold it. I'm being given the signal that we're out of time. So um, I'd like to thank our panelists for an interesting discussion. Thank you.